She phoned me this morning to say she's got it, so could I do it? So I did a wee test this morning, and I've got to stay stay negative for the next 48 hours, and then I can do that funeral, and hopefully stay negative for a bit longer than that. But, uh, so it's a scourge, even though it's perhaps not as serious as it was a couple of years ago, it still is very much with us. But surprisingly, a lot of the restrictions that we've been living under are ending. So those of you who've been um, having to tick your names as you come in, that now finishes. But for the next couple of weeks, Nicola wants us to keep wearing masks, and that makes sense, given what's happening within this and other congregations. So we continue our worship. New every morning is your mercy, O God. You save us from our transgressions. You bless us with steadfast love and mercy. In true repentance, we find new life. And so we come to God and we sing his praise and glory in our first hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, you call us into a new way of being and give us so many second chances in life. May your love wash over us as we turn towards you from our sinful ways. Mould us as your people in new and powerful ways that we may be true disciples of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. A broken and contrite heart is the acceptable sacrifice to you, O Father God. And so we come before you today as those who do wrong but need your mercy. Grant us your forgiveness, O God. Help us turn from our own ways. Lead us into newness of life, that our actions may be found pleasing in your sight. And now hear us as we pray together Jesus' prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, reading from chapter 13 again, but now back to the first nine verses. Listen for God's word. Change your hearts. At that time, some people were there who told Jesus that Pilate had kids killed some people from Galilee while they were worshipping. He mixed their blood with the blood of the animals they were sacrificing to God. Jesus answered, Do you think this happened to them because they were more sinful than all others from Galilee? No, I tell you. But unless you change your hearts and lives, you will be destroyed as they were. What about those 18 people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more sin sinful than all the others who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you change your hearts and lives, you will also be destroyed too. The useless tree. Jesus told this story. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for some fruit on the tree, but he found none. So the man said to his gardener, I have been looking for fruit on this tree for three years, but I never find any. Cut it down. Why should it waste the ground? But the servant answered, Master, let the tree have one more year to produce fruit. Let me dig up the dirt around it and put in some fertilizer. If the tree produces fruit next year, good. But if not, you can cut it down. Thanks be to God for this sharing of his holy and life-giving word, and to him be all praise and glory. <laughs> we sing our next hymn, 724, A Touching Place. Christ is the world in which we move.
things happen. Have you ever had something bad that's happened to you and make you ask if God was punishing you or why God allowed it to happen? Well, if you have, you're not alone. People have asked this question since the beginning of time. And this is the same question in the foundation of the gospel reading that I shared with you a few minutes ago. A particular, mention, particular reading mentions two incidents that are not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Pilate's slaughter of the Galileans in the temple and the collapse of the Tower of Siloam. Pilate had proved himself capable of killing Jews who displeased him or opposed his policies. The crowd apparently wanted to see Jesus' response to the Romans slaughtering righteous Jews as they performed their Jewish religious duties. When I started thinking about this service, it was before Russian soldiers had been stationed in and around Ukraine. When I thought about this, about this tower that collapsed, about the slaughter of people as they went about their religious duties. I hadn't seen or knew what was going to happen in Maripol in the last few days. And I wonder how many people in Ukraine or throughout the rest of the world are wondering whether the people of Maripol have actually done something other than just being there that has offended President Putin? Were they just an example? Or had they actually done something that meant that they deserved God's wrath? Judging by the way in which President Putin deals with things, given that he at the um, World Cup Stadium last week quoted scripture to justify entering Ukraine. I wonder if he has been reading that same reading. But going back to Jesus' day, there was a belief that at that time that severe calamities happened only to people who deserved God's judgment and that the truly righteous were spared suffering. And Jesus points out that that simply was not the case. He said, in effect, that the precarious of life in a fallen world should prompt us to think about our spiritual conditions. Jesus' words about judgment and repentance are scary, but they depict human life as being a gift, a gift of God. There are still some people today who believe that a person's suffering is a result of his or her actions. And this is true to a certain extent. For example, somebody who drinks too much and develops cirrhosis of the liver has no one to blame except himself, or possibly distiller's company. And his decision to drink alcohol to excess has clearly affected his liver. And some churches are also guilty of this sort of belief. For example, there was a church that taught that God's approval, love and blessing were all conditioned, conditional based upon individuals' performance. As a consequence, some people who had experienced spiritual abuse and 
hold a distorted image of God, see God as a sort of policeman who will punish them for anything that they might do wrong. Make no mistake, suffering is not a form of punishment. God does not want anyone to suffer. He wants us to turn away from doing wrong. He wants us to turn to him so that we may have lives with joy and abundance. But on the other hand, Jesus didn't deny the connection between sin and disasters, because many disasters are the result of the curse of human sin. Floods happen because we built in the floodplain. Famine happens because some folk are greedy so others don't get enough food. Droughts happen because we have done things which has affected our climate and so on. Jesus does challenge the notion that people who survive disasters are morally superior than the victims. Disasters are not God's way of singling out evil people. Disasters are God's way of warning everyone. Since disasters occur without warning, we need always to be ready to meet God. For Jesus, the real sin is not bearing fruit when we've been given the responsibility, the challenge, the instruction to do so. We're planted where we are, and we are called to be responsible disciples, responsible followers, folk who will do God's work in whatever calling that we have. And Jesus told several parables relating to vineyards. In each parable, the vineyard represents both the people of Israel and ourselves. According to Old Testament law, no one was to eat the fruit from newly planted trees. This fruit belonged to God. God gave Israel plenty of time to repent and to bear fruit and he gives us plenty of time to repent and bear fruit as well but eventually judgment will come God wanted to show compassion to the people of Israel and he wants to show us compassion as well but his compassion is not without limit we must not presume upon God's grace and patience. The voice of the gardener is a cry for mercy. More time is given for the tree and for us to bear fruit. The tree can't do it on its own, so the gardener will take steps to help the tree to have the opportunity to be fruitful. Similarly, God has taken steps to help us, to give us the opportunity to be fruitful. He sent Jesus to pay the penalty for our wrongdoing. He's given us instructions as what is good policy, good practice throughout the pages of the Bible. God is always on our side. He always sends us help. He always tries to encourage us in our need, our need to change, our need to live fruitful lives. The life of someone who chooses to follow Jesus consists of daily repentance, but also of renewal. Each day is a day of grace. Each day provides the opportunity to repent. Each day provides us with the chance to bear the fruit of that repentance. And when our time is up, it's up. 
God will have given us many opportunities to repent and to obey the gospel. But if we haven't, God will deal with us. Both of the stories, both about the, the collapse of buildings and about the fruitful or the lack of fruit on the fig tree, are calls to repent. God wants us to repent. God wants us to be involved, sorry, God wants to be involved in our lives and give us the promise of heaven and of that spiritual blessing. He wants to plant something in us that will grow, something that will bear fruit. And this fruit will change the way we live. It will impact upon our actions, our decisions, on our whole characters. Jesus' purpose is to redeem us. Jesus wants to see something grow within us as a result of his presence in our lives. We've no right to be taking up space in church if we're not prepared to be fruitful. We need to share Christ with other people. We do this by inviting them to church, by talking to them about Jesus with them over a cup of coffee or tea. We do this by doing things with them not necessarily preaching with words, but with actions, by showing that we are being Christians by our love, by our support, by our prayer, not simply by standing at a street corner and lambasting them. Time can be a grace for us, it gives us space. It gives us time to grow. It gives us opportunities to mature spiritually, even those of us who are of, someone say, somewhat over-mature years. We still can reform our lives. Reform is just reform. And so we can serve the Lord and re re remove the obstacles between God and us and between us and others. And it doesn't matter just what size those obstacles are. During this season of Lent, we're called on to give thanks to the one who spared us from his wrath and gave us the gift of today. So we mustn't waste that gift by going back to all the outlandish and horrible things that we might have done before we chose to become followers of Christ. We must use this season of Lent to examine what we do and to make the changes that we need to make. And we can do this by following some simple steps. First of all, we need to acknowledge that we have a need for God and we do that through prayer and through our hearts, through how we feel about things. Then we need to confess what we've done that's wrong and we must accept God's forgiveness and lay claim to his love. And that requires us to change our minds, to re-examine some of the things about our lives, some of the things that we have put as high priorities that we shouldn't, and to make a new start in making a better pattern of the activity that we engage in. And finally, perhaps most importantly, we need to bear fruit. We have to show some new actions, some new practices, some new behaviour that reflects the, God, the love that God has for us and the love that we have for God. When we walk with God, we will be strengthened by his presence and we will find hope through his love. That makes all the difference to us. 
when times are tough, we need to remember that we are not alone. We know that God is there, willing, wanting, offering us the opportunity simply to give, accept his help. Our faith will keep us on the right path. It will help to keep us moving. It will help us to keep on trying to do the right things. God walks with us even through the valley of the shadow of death because Jesus opened the doorway to eternal life for us. That gives us hope. That hope is a blessing. And as we think, as we have been for the last few weeks, about the situation in Ukraine, we have to do things that will show the people of Ukraine that we have not given up so that they don't give up. We need to show that we are true followers of Christ, that we are the arms out, outstretched of God's hand of mercy in the suffering that they are in encountering at this moment, that what we can do, limited as it might be, is our Christian faith in action. But while we think about the folk in Ukraine because they are on our headlines, we mustn't forget all of the other places within this world, within our own communities, that also need to know that we love them. Whether they are in Syria or Palestine, in Eritrea, in South Africa, wherever. Whether they are in Batesford or Langleys or New Carrum or the rest of Scotland or the rest of the world. We are followers of Christ and are called through that to support them through all the difficulties they may face. And so let us take a closer walk with God as we sing our next hymn.
Here is the church news. There is a special collection taking place for Ukraine this and next week in the um, pewter plate at the door. If you uh, saw or arrived early enough, you saw that you could get a wee sunflower as a receipt for your gift. Uh, we've run out of them, I'll try and get some more for next week. Uh, I would point out to you that if you put them through, through a buttonhole, you need to have some way of stopping it from falling out, because that happened to me with one of mine. So a wee pin going through it, or a wee bit of sellotape to hold it in place. Otherwise, you'll be coming back next week and saying, I lost it on the way home from the Kirk last Sunday. Um, the sunflower is a symbol of uh, Ukraine and is one of their uh, major export crops. So it's an appropriate symbol. And the sunflower and sky of the blue and yellow form their flag. You see I'm wearing them upside down again. My yellow shirt and blue jumper. The Kirk session will meet on Thursday the 31st of March at 7.30 here in the church. And everyone is welcome to attend that meeting. At that meeting, we'll have to homologate that we're going to have a collection in aid of Ukraine, but I think I don't think the Kirk session are going to disagree with that. The Harley Court Cafe Church service, we're remarketing and going up market. We're starting with our cuppa. It was an accident last month, but it's it's deliberate for this month. Uh, this Wednesday at half past ten. Please join with Book in Harley Court in the lounge for an informal church service. And there will also be, it probably won't involve a cup of coffee at the beginning because of the new cams, uh, but they're assuming that we're allowed in, there will be a service uh, similar to that at New Cairn Court on Monday the 28th, not tomorrow, but the following Monday. So that is Harley Court Cafe Church. Come and have a cuppa and um, it will lead into a service. The Mother's Day service is next Sunday. Remember that the clocks change, so don't turn up once it's over. On the 3rd of April, I'm away, and so Eileen and Jim will be leading, and I learnt this morning after I put all this uh, together that the service theme will be called Beauty for Brokenness. Got that, Jim? Beauty for Brokenness. That's one of the hymns that I'm sure we will sing. And when I come back, we will be thinking about Palm Sunday and uh, the Holy Week services start after Palm Sunday and on the Tuesday there will be a service here. And there will be other Holy Week services about which there will be um, a handout hopefully available next week. And then we come back after that to Easter Sunday. If you really want to celebrate Easter Sunday, half past eight in Prince's Park, bring your eggs to roll and join in a service led by Robert Allen of Trinity Church. Please remember, even though we're taking a focus on um, Ukraine, that there are folk locally who can't put food on their tables, so keep supporting the food bank. And keep supporting folk, particularly those who are um, isolating or a wee bit fear to come out, and pick up your phone and have a chat with the likes of folk who haven't been getting out. I hear that Charlie is making reasonable recovery, but is still not able to move very far. Um, he's not getting any further social work type support, but uh, he struggles a wee bit with his Zimmer to move from uh, his living room to his kitchen. And Eileen has gone down with COVID along with Jimmy, and so it's, it's rife. And these are, I think, all the things to share with you, unless anybody has anything nice and happy to support, to tell us about. Okay, let us pray. We have a habit, Lord, of putting everything off until the last minute. 
You invited us and encouraged us on this journey. You've reminded us of the struggles and of the hope. You ask us to let go of the things that stop us from serving you. But we have a nasty tendency to wait until it's almost too late, until the last minute. We can't seem to let go of hurt, of fear and pain. And so on this journey, remind us again of your healing love, your forgiving power. Help us to trust the goodness and potential for good that you've placed in all of us. Lord, we came here this morning to hear your word, to sing and to pray to you in hope, to enable us to find the courage that we might really believe in you, that your healing love may permeate our whole souls and prepare us for true witness. Lord, as we think of others, we're not going to focus on just one particular problem, but on all the problems that face folk throughout the world, throughout our community. And so in a wee time of silence, we think of our friends and family. We think of those trapped under the building in Maripol and throughout Ukraine in other parts of the world places that have been on our headlines in past years or weeks but have slipped places where folk may say ah the Ukrainians they're good guys but the Palestinians they're not Or the Syrians, or the folk from Sudan, we think of all the efforts that go into trying to reverse climate change, which tend to fall on deaf ears in China in India, parts of the United States, and even in our own homes as we don't put on an extra jumper but turn the heating up. Lord, in all we do, in all we say, in all we think, may we be true disciples. In Jesus' name, Amen. And Jesus' love is something which is permanent, something that will never let me go.
may the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of us, with all whom we love, and all whom we find it hard to love but ought to, today, tomorrow, and forever.